Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman here, and he's the best storyteller in the game, and it's time to sit back, relax, and have some laughs. Welcome to the mayor's office, and here's your host, Sean Casey. Boom, Chinch, we're back. We we're are. back, brother. Yeah. How you doing, man? What's going on? I'm fired up because we have a strong, <laughs> not a wrong island, but a strong <laughs> island legend here today. I'm <laughs> so fired up. <laughs> oh, dude, I'll tell you what, man. This guy's a legend on the show, and he hasn't been on yet, you <laughs> yeah. know, from all our fans and our guests. But I'm going to give him his proper introduction. 111 and 103 is big league career. Played 14, just under four, about 14 years in the big leagues with 389 ERA. 1991 All Star. Played with, drafted by the Orioles. Traded to the Astros in one of the worst trades in Orioles history, still to this day, maybe the worst. The Mets. Uh, the Brewers for one year. I didn't know that. And then the Reds. Um, uh, also, this guy, of all the guys that I've played with, and, and you know, there's certain people that take you under their wing when you first come up when you're a young kid. This was my guy. So let's bring him in. My, my man, our friend, Pete Hardish. What's up, Ooh. Peter? How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. That's probably <laughs> the nicest I've ever been introduced. And I, I'd like to start the show by just saying how honored I am to be your 1163rd <laughs> guest in your 900th episode. <laughs> It means so. It means so much to me that that you thought so highly of me to bring me in. Uh, well, I, I don't know where to start. I'm just. I'm. 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 I'm, I'm tongue tied. We wanted to make sure we had the lighting and the audio video right before yeah. we brought you on. We had to make. Oh, sure. <laughs> Eleven hundred tries later, it took you to get the lighting right. And you got me putting my iPad on books. You guys are awesome. <laughs> the budget for this show must be unbelievable. Oh, it is. It's <laughs> zero. <laughs> me and Chip, me and Chinch are making absolutely zero dollars. So we're 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 dominating. We're dominating so far. <laughs> and two of the three people that were listening just hung up. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Oh man! So Peter, what's go? What's going on, brother? I saw you. I saw you a couple weeks ago, in uh, or a couple months ago, in uh, out with Jack at Fordham. My son Andrew was playing for Dayton, and Jack's playing at Fordham. And uh, man, it was so great to see you. But what do you? What else are you doing, brother? What's What's going on out there this summer? I just like talk about that day for two seconds. It was such a privilege, man. It was so awesome. I thought that you know we had played together and we're such good friends over the years, and to have both our sons competing. You know, in Division One on the field, even though Jack swung like he was uh, Stevie, w- <laughs> Stevie Wonder that day, he had he had a rough day, and he wanted he was trying to impress you so much. He was the little guy. I felt so bad for him, but he had a really good year. He just committed for his fifth year to uh, Santa Clara. So oh, going nice, to, dude! Oh yeah, yeah. West Coast Conference, really great business school. He's going to get a great business degree. Um, and the coach called him out of the blue and offered him a scholarship. He's going out West Coast, yeah. Oh, good for him, dude. What an experience that'll be, huh? So excited. He's an East Coast kid his whole life. He's going to go experience the West Coast. They play Stanford, Arizona State in the Middle East, and and the conference is Gonzaga, San Diego. You know, it's a really good baseball conference, so – He's oh. really, really excited about that. I'm, I'm That's fired great. Up. He may never come back, bro. <laughs> don't, don't, don't even say that. And if he sees Donna you would have a that, heart attack. Donna would have a heart attack. Yeah, if he sees you even mention that and he doesn't come back, I'm coming after you and your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, Jack's got a great swing, dude. He's going to do great out there in Santa Clara. I'm fired up for him, man. Yeah, you know how it is in the Northeast and, and Dayton specifically in the cold. The first two-thirds of yeah. the season, the ball doesn't travel. So. <laughs> It's yeah, snowing. Um, Santa, snowing. Clara, Santa Clara coach told him a lot of untapped power. The ball flies here. You're gonna you're gonna have a great year. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get you fired up. So he's he's really excited about. It. Well, what are you gonna do, dude? Because I know you're like the ultimate dad, where you travel for like all the games and everything. Are you gonna go live out? Are you gonna get a condo in Santa Clara? No, we're gonna try to go out there every four to six weeks. Hopefully, uh, hopefully once a month. It's a long trip. You know, I'm not a West Coast yeah. guy. I'm not a huge California person, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'll probably just borrow some money or charge it to your credit card. And just it. <laughs> That'll be awesome. Thank you for that. Oh my God. I thought they so told good. me when I, before I got on today, that six, uh, six round trip, uh, West coast. <laughs> yeah. that. You got it. <laughs> then I That's saw, so- then I saw the books under the iPad and the cat. And I knew that they, the budget was not going to support that. Oh my God. So great, dude. Uh, so, dude, what have you been doing this? Are you, are you been golfing a lot? Or? I no, know you're actually, right there. 
I know you're right there on that course, though. Me and D. Rowe played there a couple of years ago, and we, we, came into, we, we came into your backyard. We're like, Pete, yeah. we're golfing at Colts Neck. Was it Colts Neck or something? Colts Neck uh, Club? Uh, yeah, Trump Colts Neck. But I sent the dogs after you guys and got rid of you real fast. So that was good. <laughs> uh, but, um, no, I haven't played that course. I'm not a member of that place. I'm a member of another place. I haven't played as much because I was just in uh, Georgia and Alabama and Hoover for that Elite 17. I got Nick. Oh, you know, with Nick. With Nick. Here. 17 yeah. year he hit uh he's up to 88 on the gun he's he's uh he's a pitcher and he, he can wing it man he's got so he's got a lot of interest so he's doing these tournaments and the coaches are coming to watch him so hopefully he finds his way but he's got he's got which is it's unbelievable dude. he has the greatest his changeup is unbelievable like we've been working on i just decided yeah because you know me that i see the puzzled look i had no change up <laughs> i i said to him i said you're 17 and i pitched in the big leagues for 14 years your change up is 10 times better than mine now so oh, wow uh, working on the breaking ball. I didn't let him throw a breaking ball till like last year. He's very late, you know, so we're working on that, but the changeup he's been working on since the 11th got an unbelievable changeup. He's up to 80, 86, 88, and he keeps climbing. Wow. So, yeah. He's, great. he's good. Man. He's good. Yeah. That's great, dude. Now Pete, for you, like as a dad, like, you know, playing 14 years in the big leagues, going all-star games, being the pitch that you were, um, you know, what, it, how how is it being a dad? Like, are are you are you hard on your kids? Are you on them all the time? Are you do you lay off? Like, wh- wh- what what is your role as a, you know as your parent as a parent knowing what you know? I would say on a scale of one to ten, one being uh, the Brady Bunch father and ten being <laughs> the worst baseball dad ever. I would say with Jack, I was probably a five, and with Nick, uh, I've learned a lot, so I'm probably a two three. I really, I rarely, I know how hard the game is. You know, that's the one privilege that we have from playing the game for so long. We understand how difficult this game is, and it yeah. it, it can eat you alive if you let it. We, we all know that. We've all been in that spot, and I've been in that spot, so fortunate. I'm fortunate to realize that. Um, really only effort, you know, if there's ever a lack of effort. And they're kids, so their, their effort goes up and down. They both love the game, but, you know, when Jack, uh, you know, a ball, he'd kick off him, and he wouldn't finish the play, and, you know, a guy would get an extra base because he didn't hop. You know, I would I would get on him for that. But like as far as like, oh, you, you got to hit the ball. You, you can't strike out. You know, I, I've never done that because I understand how difficult the game is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way, too. <laughs> like I, I think early on when the kids are younger, you know, I remember getting on him a little, probably a little more. But like I did, I was obviously a first time dad, so didn't understand it. But as you start to realize this game is so freaking hard. And when they get into high school and the, and the kids are better, you know what I mean? And they get into college ball. It's like, wow, man, it's like, and I guess, I guess you're only going to be as good as the work you put into it too. You know what I mean? I think that's probably one of the biggest things you do. You're one of the hardest workers I've been around your routines between your starts and the way you used to get after it and cardio wise and stuff. So you obviously know that. Do you push that onto the, to Nick now and Jack, like, Hey man, it's only as hard as you work as says how good you're going to be. I do. You know, Nick is in an interesting spot. He's transforming from a, um, you know, a two way guy to now pitching is the only thing that really gets him excited now, you know? Yeah. So he, he's, he, he's tired of trying to make adjustments with the bat. He's not the hitter. Jack has the, the beautiful, you saw a lefty swing. And beautiful all. swing, big um, power. And even though I'm on the home run list, the all time home run list, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I know how hard hitting was, even though I made a lot of unbelievable highlights in the batter's box, uh, I realized how difficult it was. So Jack is, you know, far exceeded that. But like I said, I always told them, Go, go to practice and be the best practice player. Be the, be the guy who works the hardest in practice. Be the guy who works hardest on the field. You don't have to be perfect. You can make an error. You can strike out with the base loaded. You can pop up to the pitcher with the base loaded. But do it making an effort, you know? So I always wanted them to to work on their focus and their work ethic. And the rest, will t- if they have talent, to take care of themselves. And, and they're both very good in that regard. Yeah, that's awesome. It is fun though, dude. It is fun to see like your your kids play, like to see Jack play at Fordham, and then now awesome. going to Santa Clara, and now to see Nick kind of evolve and becoming this pitcher. He's becoming with a good change. And you know what's funny is, dude, if, you know if you got an eighty six, eighty eight mile an hour fastball with a good changeup, that eighty six to eighty eight looks like ninety four, ninety five. It's it's phenomenal what a good changeup will do. I tell him all the time, he loves throwing it 3-2. He loves throwing it 2-0 if the three-hole hitter's up. And he's not afraid to throw it in any count. And I say, it's an unbelievable trait. I keep harping on him. I keep telling him. I said, the breaking ball will come. You know, he throws some really, really good breaking balls and some really bad. It's just inconsistent right now. He can spin yeah. it, but just not consistently. But I said, it doesn't matter because you're blessed with the ability. You can pitch fastball changeup to anybody, righties, anybody. lefties. 
Changeup is the worst, especially righties. Righties never look for changeups off righties. He's right-handed. I said, you're throwing, you know, you're, you're touching 88. And he's been climbing every kind of outing the last three outings, picked up a tick. So he's he's got more to get, and he's not done yet. So he's got more velo there. But the changeup is like 10 miles an hour off with fade. Wow. Really, really good extension. I mean, it's it's really a special pitch. And I said, I said, if you're breaking balls, not that pitch fastball changeup. It, it wipes people out. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's great, dude. That's yeah. great. Well, I want to re- I want to rewind Peter like and and go back, you know, obviously it's so cool cuz we're talking about your kids and, you know, it's seeing you a couple weeks ago, you know, with Jack at Fordham, but like you were also a, For- a Fordham guy. Uh, you know, and Ch- my Chinch is is a Long Island guy too, so you think you guys are both both have that in common. Yeah. Um, he claims Chinch, what, what's that? <laughs> He claims to be. I, no, I do claim to be. I also didn't play in big leagues, but I do have one thing know. in common. You played for Coach Gallagher, right? I did. Yeah, Dan he, Gallagher. How about this? When I was a sophomore in high school and getting recruited, he came to some of our games, and I, and I was always playing middle infield. And he told my father when I was like 13, he goes, he's a center fielder. He would Next year, I started playing a little outfield. Junior year, he goes up, he tells my father, he goes, your son's a center fielder. Start playing center my senior year, and all of a sudden my recruiting went through the roof, <laughs> and I owed yeah. it all to him. I was an inch away from going to, to Fordham in case. This guy is a big dude, right? Big, intimidating, <laughs> strong yeah, yeah. man. He was like a legend on Long Island. And, of course, with you being there and the guys you played with, like it was. It, we were all just like obsessed with your career and following you guys. And <clears throat> everybody fell in love with those Fordham teams you played on, so it's, it's pretty awesome to have you on personally. Yeah, thank you. He's a huge uh he was a huge part of my career and, and, and my development in college. And um, I wasn't heavily recruited in high school. I mean, I played JV in 10th grade and I wasn't a pitcher. So I, I, in 11th grade, I made the team, uh, but I wasn't, you know, I played three games a week. We had a couple all county guys that were juniors like me. And then we had a senior who was the captain of the team was our number one pitcher. So I wasn't going to pitch at all. And I got an inning in relief in a tournament early in the year and struck out three guys on like 10, 11 pitches, probably throwing, I don't know, 82 miles an hour, 81, 82 miles an hour, all fastballs, right? by guys. And uh, and then one guy got injured. I moved into the – I pitched the second half of junior year and my senior year. That's all the pitching I did oh. before before I went to Fordham. So it's it was an interesting story. I was – you know, people assume that we played in the big leagues, that we were like stars. You know, in Little League, we were right. stars in travel ball. We were stars in whatever the 14U thing is, damn music or whatever it is. Uh, not me. You know, I was just a regular guy and I, I wasn't even guaranteed to make the team as a junior in high school. So um, kind of a different story and and, uh, and off we went. But he was a he just uh, he just passed away two Octobers ago. So um, it, it was a major loss. We were all a lot of guys. It was amazing. I tell I told him all the time we did a couple of roasts. We roasted him. He was always trying to raise money. He had, he had all these interesting ways to, to, to raise money. So when I was done playing, he, they do one roast. I think he sold. uh I think he sold my first Fordham uh, first game I pitched Jersey from Fordham. I think he raffled that off like thirty seven times. <laughs> I didn't know. I, I didn't know I switched jerseys four times every inning. But um, yeah, my one of my good buddies who's an alum and, and a big supporter of the baseball program. He says, "Hey, I got like five of your first game jerseys." I said, oh. So so he had some interesting ways to do things and. Uh, he would do a roast and I always used to tell the line at the roast was always so great. It was, uh, I said, it, it's a, the true measure of a man is not really the people who love you that come back to a thing like this, but the people that hated you like Tommy Mack, Jackie <laughs> Allen, Brad Allen. And I, I stopped pointing at all the players that couldn't stand them, but they realized over time, it's funny. They, they realized over time what an impact he made on their lives and uh, really awesome. You know, just an awesome man rough around the edges. Today's climate wouldn't have lasted, I think, three or four days. <laughs> I don't like, know like what, like Pete, what did he do? Like, what are some stories that you look back and like, can't that, that would not fly in 2022? Dude, he had guys. He had guys. If they were late, they'd run a whole double header. Oh my god! <laughs> what? A whole double header. Jog it. Oh. Hey, they got to stop in between games for 20 minutes, have a sandwich, and then they had to go back and jog. Oh. These people were moving backwards. They'd run for like five hours straight. <laughs> It was unbelievable. He's trotting back and forth on the outside of the home run fence. And he could watch him because we didn't have anything on the fence. It was just a chain link fence. And it was, I mean, uh, t- uh, touch the backboard 500 times. Wow, so you have to, God. like, if you were late, you, you come in the gym in the winter. We worked out in the gym. You walk in late. Okay, you guys touch the backboard 500 times. Do you know what it's like? You can jump at that age. You could jump up and touch the bottom of the backboard. Yeah. But 
you do it like 30 times and you're done. <laughs> and they had to do it like 500. So they're jumping and they're not, even, they're not even getting off. The sneakers aren't even leaving the ground. There are about 40 of them. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. <laughs> the, the things he called us, hey, the, the words that he called us, I mean, I'm telling you, he would have been hired on a Sunday and fired on a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my, dude! I remember back. I remember my freshman year in college. We uh, we were um, we were in the study hall, and and it was me and uh, Jay Adams, John Dorman, Hank Aaron. I mean uh, Henry Henry Ogden, um, uh, Mike Walton, and we were we were you know making paper balls, and the the lady that Imagine was doing that. yeah <laughs> we. <laughs> I'm uh, surprised. Were, were you at a Friday for the kids' menu doing the word search? Is that what your homework was? Go ahead. Yes. Right, go ahead. That's where I was. But we were hitting, you know, pelting the lady at study hall, or whatever. So anyway, oh, the next no. day, the next day at, at practice, you know, Coach Atkins is like, you know, our GA Wayne Smith was in charge of the freshmen. So Coach Atkins is like, Wayne, take care of these guys. I can't believe they're, you know, doing this in study hall. And so Wayne's like, all right, guys, you pissed me off for the last time. Meet me at four thirty tomorrow at the basketball stadium. I'm like, what? So we meet at like four thirty, five o'clock at the Robin Center at Richmond, bro. We ran every step. We weren't allowed to we oh. skip step every step to the top, and at the top you had to yell respect. So you had the whole, <laughs> all the, all the, <laughs> all the freshmen going up, set to the top respect, and everyone had to go till we threw up. So that was the thing. You uh, knew, you, we weren't allowed to be done until we threw up. And I was like, that would never fly nowadays in 2022. No. Like, like they could never get away with that. You know what I mean? It's better. To let, <laughs> first time you did something wrong, you said, all right, let's go. Show up tomorrow at 430. I'll meet you in the shower. <laughs> hey, was it the same arena? I was just in the Richmond <laughs> arena. We, is that the same arena? Yeah, the Robinson. Center. Yeah, same arena. Was that was in there. It's a different, I think it's a different name now, but it's a beautiful arena. Have they redone it? Beautiful. Things, right? it's, it's unbelievable. Beautiful. That yeah. campus is unreal. The campus, my little guy, my yeah. little guy is interested in Richmond. <laughs> oh you know, yeah, dude. Yeah, it's a really good school, and he really, he really loved it. We just recently went through the campus. We went there in William and Mary on the way down to Georgia. We stopped in in Richmond. What a beautiful place, man! Oh, dude, he would love it there, bro. He would love it. We'll give Tracy you know Woodson. Tracy Woodson? Tra- yeah, do you know Tracy? Tracy played in the big leagues a little bit with the Dodgers and like the I late eighties. I, I played. I think I played against them. Um, I think I might have played against them like in spring training. Uh, yeah. Fort St. Lucie when I was with the Orioles coming up. I I, I feel yeah. like I faced him or whatever. Yeah. 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 Was, that'd be awesome. Well, let me know. We'll give Tracy a call if Nick wants to go there. We'll see what he can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He loves it. He, <laughs> he loved the school. He's got the he's got the grades for it. He's like he's a really yeah. student. So and he's got the boards. They have trouble getting people in. They, you gotta have high board, you know, almost 1,400 on your board. Oh, dude, it's record, ridiculous. Which which I know they didn't. I think, it, what was it, 600 back when you? <laughs> dude, <laughs> swear to God, when I was first getting recruited, Coach McQueen calls me. He's like, hey, uh, we're just calling to see what your uh, SATs are. I'm like, I think I'm at like an 850. He's like, well, you know, give us a call back if, you know. So uh, I took the Princeton Review and I got my – I got it up to 10, 10. They're like, all right, that'll work. We can recruit you now. I was like, yes, 10, 10, get you into Richmond back then. You know? Yeah. 10, 10 without getting your name right. That's awesome. <laughs> Cause, you, Cause you get a couple hundred points for that. So as soon as you corrected your name, you probably went up to like, 12. <laughs> it was perfect. It was yeah. perfect. That's so awesome. Peter, you said you didn't even, you didn't really obviously pitch in high school. You started to pitch part of your junior year into your senior year. Like, and you end up at Fordham, and then you end up obviously being maybe the most recognizable figure in Fordham history. When did you start to, like, you know, throw a little harder? When did you start to develop, the, you know, the pitches that you developed to become a first-round pick three years later? Yeah, I don't, honestly, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But Dan, Dan Gallagher was a, was a part-time scout for the, for the Dodgers. So after my junior year, I, had a, I, I told you I didn't pitch till halfway through my junior year. I made probably the last – I probably made four or five starts my junior year, the last half of the season. And uh, I got invited to a uh, – that day, the day I mentioned earlier, I struck out three guys on like 10 pitches throwing fastballs like, I don't know, 82, 83, whatever it was. Uh, I had a couple of scouts come up to me off the field and hand me these little information cards. You know, they just take your name, address, whatever, parents' name. So I filled them out. It was the Giants and the Reds, believe it or not. And then uh, after, after high school, I got an invite to a pro scouting thing. Um, it was really weird. Is that Mitchell Field in, in Nassau County? Yeah, Mitchell and Field. And you literally, you, yeah, you just showed up 
He got loose in the bullpen. The pitchers, the other guys did other stuff. He got loose in the bullpen. You went on the mound. You threw three fastballs, and that was it. You went home. <laughs> and I threw 85, 85, 86. I remember the numbers. I remember the day very well. And that was on the the old ray gun case. So, so oh, right. It's probably 90s. I think it was the old – you know, I, I can't even be sure that now that I say it, but I think it was the old ray gun. So I think they were probably figuring it was more like, you know, the jugs gun, 88, 89 or whatever. I don't know. But then uh, – so he recruited me to Fordham out of the blue. I was going to – I was going to Eckerd College in, in uh, St. Petersburg, the really good Division II school. And uh, out of the blue, the scouting was done totally different. He called me December of my senior year. And he said, hey, Fordham, you know, and I didn't know anything about Fordham. I, I heard of it. I'd never been there. It's like, I'm not going to school in the Bronx or whatever. But back then, my parents were like, hey, awesome. You're going to college. Good luck. You know, give you a pat on the butt and off you go. <laughs> There's no money or no, you know what I mean? Yeah, like right. all my other brothers and sisters went to SUNY schools. You know, back then they were three, four thousand dollars there. Cortland, Binghamton, you know, like that. Um, Albany. So um, it was like you can go to college, but you got to figure it out. So. He called me in and uh, he said, I'm having a bunch of guys up. I went on a Sunday to Fordham. My parents took me up. We drove in. Immediately when I stepped on campus, I was floored by the campus. I don't know. You guys are okay, beautiful. You, it's yeah. so yeah. beautiful. You would, if I, if I blindfolded you and dropped you in the middle of that, you would never <laughs> guess you were in the Bronx. You, right. you, would, you would have no idea you were in New York City. You at think all. you're in England. You think you're it's in England. Beautiful. The architecture, the tree, you know, even in December, the trees don't have leaves on them, but it was the Edwards Parade, the big grassy area in the middle. Everybody throws frisbees and hangs out. It was, un- I was so floored by the campus. And then I was told it was a really good school and uh, the money was right. You know, back then, I, I think my freshman year, it's crazy. I think it was like $9,200 a year, room and board and, and tuition. Wow. You know, now it's what's got to be 70, 70, 70 yeah. <laughs> yeah, 22, <laughs> 75 or whatever. So, um, but yeah, the money was right. It was my ticket to go play. I didn't really want to go to Florida. I wanted to kind of stay closer to home. And uh, off I went. And then I started, uh, I hit 90 my sophomore, no, I guess maybe my, maybe fall of my freshman year. I probably hit 90 for the first time. And wow. he said, when you leave here, you're going to be throwing 95 miles an hour. I'm like, you're out of your mind, you know? <laughs> and then sophomore year, after sophomore year, he sat me down. He said, if you have a good year next year, you work hard, you have a good year next year, you got a shot at getting picked in the first round, Scott's telling me. Wow. So it was like just a crazy, meteoric, crazy thing that happened and off i went you know? wow dude wow that's that's awesome that's yeah. awesome so when you got you got drafted obviously in the first round by the orioles um you know take us through that moment the call you know everything that went through that and you know in, in your first year you know in the minor leagues crazy i was uh, i didn't want to i was like nervous about it but the orioles actually had three picks i was a uh, one of those compensatory picks they lost um Rick Dempsey, the catcher, to, to, yeah, yeah, to, yep, the, yep. to the Dodgers. So they got an extra pick. I think I, I was 26th overall or 28th. Or, I don't know. 26th overall, I think. Um, but they had the 7, 15, and 26. So they took a lefty high school guy, Chris Myers. They took another guy, Brad Duval from Virginia Tech, 15. And they took me, 26. And, um, yeah, it was – it, it was surreal. I was around the house, you know, back then there's no cell phone. You're not going to call the house right. or whatever, you know? Right. So I right. had some family over, they called the house, the Orioles, Roland Heeman called me up, said, uh, you know, we just took you, blah, blah, blah. We're excited to have you just that and the other thing. And, and off I went. The, the great thing about that was I tell the, the Mets were interested at the time, I guess the mm. New York ties or whatever. And the Mets had, you know, Sid and doc and oh. uh, I'm trying to think who else Sid, doc, Ron Darling, uh, who are their, their roster? Oh, Coney. Like it was a crazy, the, the, the staff was crazy. If I had been drafted by the Mets, it probably would have taken me five years. I got drafted in June of 87 and I was in the big leagues in 88, September of 88. So I was one year in the minor leagues and I hit every level. I started wow. rookie. I hit, I started in rookie ball. So back then with the Orioles, the way they were, they were terrible. They lost a hundred and I think they lost 107 games the prior year or whatever in 87. I think that was the year they went 0-21 to start the season. That's right, yeah. And, yeah, I think so. And then it was like, if you pitch good, you go to the next level. So I went to rookie ball, pitch good. I went to A ball, pitch good. I went to double A. And then I started the next – that was the end of the first half. And then the next year I started in double A, went to triple A at the All-Star break and got called up in September. Yeah, it was crazy, man. Crazy. Wow. What was that like for you? Like, uh, you know, getting, getting called up and like, and, you know, take us through that too. When you first got called up and like your first start, who was your first starting? I think who was your I first was, starting? Yeah, I was, I was petrified. Uh, 
I, I would say I would say I wanted to cry, but I did cry. So so I didn't really want to cry. I actually did cry. So um, I don't think I slept. I was supposed to pitch games. It was funny. We were playing the Expos, Indianapolis. Uh, uh, I don't know if they were the Indians back there, the Expos. But the AAA team from Montreal was like uh, Grissom, the Shields. Oh, yeah. They were great. Uh, Randy Johnson was there. Jeez. Uh, Brian Brian Holman was there. Oh, they, they were loaded. Yeah. So we wound up playing them in the AAA World Series. We won the International League. They won the American Association. They play a World Series. I was supposed to pitch game seven of of the uh thing and we wound up losing to randy johnson in game six so we lost four two and after the game johnny oates called me and he's like hey man you had a great time glad you came here everything worked out great blah 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 so happy you're here by the way you're pitching in boston tomorrow <laughs> and, and, oh. i think i turned white <laughs> and and that's when i started to cry like uh i think three seconds later my eyes filled up and i was like oh boy and they were not tears of joy they were tears of fear i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and man up and be like, oh, I was ready for the big league. I was petrified. I was 20. What was I? So it was 88. It was before my birthday. I was 21. 21, it says here. I, I was turning 22. It was September 13th, pitching in wow. Boston. The first six guys in the lineup were all batting over 300. It was uh, Boggs. Karen with a second baseman for some reason. Then it was Dewey Evans, Jim Rice. Oh, Mar- Marty, Marty Barrett. Uh, might have been Marty Barrett. Yeah, having a big year for him. Dewey Evans, uh, you know Dwight Evans, unbelievable. Jim Rice, mm, Ellis Burke. Oh Ellis my Burke, God, Mike Greenwell. Ooh. Oh, you know, Greenwell dude. raked. Yeah. Oh, forget it, dude. It was uh, <laughs> so, well. So also, also, hotel. Cal Ripken Jr. is standing at shortstop behind you too, right? Like, are, like, yeah. isn't that just uh, as intimidating as the other guys you're facing in the other lineup? Uh, yeah, pretty much. But I was, uh, was, oh no, I wasn't even in big league camp. No, yeah, right. I didn't know any of these guys. Yeah, I was, pet- I, I was just petrified. Just call it what it is. I mean, I was so scared. I think I was sucking my thumb all night. And uh, so, hold on, it gets better. I got to fly from Indianapolis, I think, to Pittsburgh, to somewhere else, to Boston. So we get some delays. I got three flights. You know how AAA flights go. Oh, yeah. I got up at 3.30 to go to the airport. Well, I, I got out of bed. I was already up. But I got 3.30, <laughs> take the flights, get to Boston. We get to the hotel from the thing. The bus is pulling out. It's like 4 o'clock for 7 o'clock. Oh, my o'clock. God. I'm just getting there. I throw my bags down, check in my room. We get a cab over. I said, the, the guys who were late, it was uh, Bob Malacky, myself. You know, the call-ups. There was three or four yeah. guys. So we said, we'll meet down here in five minutes. We'll take the thing over there. I go over there. Frank Robinson calls me in the office. Now, I got... Half of Fordham is driving up, right? They're coming up from school. Yeah, no, I'm serious. Like 200 people convoyed up there. What? Yeah, 200. I got every person I know on the East Coast coming to the game. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, hey, kid, I know you've had a horrible day. He said, uh, if, you want to, if you want to take the night off and pitch tomorrow. I said, no, Frank, I'm, I'll go now. And I really just wanted to say, can I just go home? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, and Frank, Rob- yeah, Frank Robinson's job. <laughs> so you know it was that won't be the last time we see him little Petey. um <laughs> don't get scared it's actually just a problem <laughs> so great. Yeah, so great. Yeah, if you're just listening so, you're, you're gonna but um it. yeah i pitched and i actually it's so hysterical dude i give up a grand slam to jim rice in the in third inning. in the third uh, inning um Thank God I had I had Durwood Merrill. I don't do you remember Durwood Merrill? Durwood Merrill, oh, yeah, umpire. So thank <clears> God I got Durwood Merrill. He was like really good to the young guys. He was known to be really he was a pitcher's umpire anyway. But a lot of the guys would be like, you know, you wouldn't get any calls or whatever. He actually called a normal game. He gave me some pitches on the corners, which I didn't expect. But I'm pitching a Wade Boggs, you know, Wade Boggs back then would Oh my god, yeah, I'm three three eighty. Yeah. So yeah, he could one hop the left fielder whenever he wanted. Literally on any pitch, whenever he could hit a one hop to the left fielder, whenever he wanted. It was like ridiculous. So he was uh, he'd strike out like seven, eight times a year. Sometimes he's had he had he god. went six hundred at bats and struck out like one percent. It was crazy stuff. Oh my god! And uh, plus he'd walk you know he'd walk one hundred and thirty times. You know he had the greatest eye. He never swung. And I'm like I'm not going to throw a strike. I am not going to throw a strike this entire game. I'm going to embarrass everyone I know. And it's just going to be, uh, this is just going to be the worst thing ever. And uh, I actually got through seven minutes. I gave the grand slam, nothing else. We lost four to three. I actually pitched pretty well outside of a ball that 
is like still going. The one light pole <laughs> the monster in left center field actually moved out of the way. It did one of these little. Really? <laughs> I've never seen a light pole do that. And uh, yeah, it was. So then Jim Palmer, you know, wise ass that he is. He was great to oh. me. I have to say Jim Palmer was great to me when I was young. He was awesome to me. He comes in after the game. He's like, way to go, kid. And he loves to plug himself. You know, Jim Palmer. <laughs> oh, yeah, he loves it. He loves one of the, you know, obviously one of the 30, 25 or 30 best pitchers of all time. But he comes in, he goes, he goes, man, it took you four innings to give up a grand slam. I didn't give up one in 20 years. So never <laughs> again. I'm like, I feel much better now. Thanks, asshole. See ya. <laughs> I feel much better. Thanks for pumping me up. I feel so so glad to be here. I have to say, here. Jim Palmer, was, he was great to me when I was young. He really helped me out a lot. We were similar high fastball guys with, you know, breaking ball below and high fastball above. So he, he saw, uh, you know, whatever, you know, a little bit of me and him. You know. Well, Peter, you, you spent or a little bit of him uh, and me. about Sorry. two. Yeah. You spent about oh, a little over two years with them, with, with, the, with the, with the Orioles and you were in that trade. It was you. Wait, wait, did you come up with Schilling? Cause you were in the Schilling was in this trade. It was you Schilling and fin- Steve Finley for Glenn Davis to the Astros. Now was Schilling in the minors with you or, or uh, you were only there one year. So yes, he was behind me. He was in double a, uh, no, I take that back. He was called up. He was called up, but he was called up to triple a later than me. I was already there. <laughs> So that's right. It was Kurt, Bobby Malacky, myself. Uh, Finley didn't get called up, though. Somebody else. There was four of us or whatever. But um, that's a yeah, dude, he, you he guys was, were loaded. He, had, he came over for Mike Boddicker, like in the middle of that year. Kurt from Boston. Kurt was with Boston. Oh, that's right. He was Mike Boddicker went to Boston and then Boston sent Kurt back. That's right. So, yeah, that's and right. He got pulled up. He pitched that September with me, too. So when you got traded in that trade, they say that's still one of the worst trades for the O's, one of the best ever for the Astros. When you got traded over, because you had some good numbers with the Orioles, I'm I'm shocked that they traded you. But when you went to the Astros, you really kind of went to another level. Were you? How did you feel about the trade when when you got traded to the Astros initially? All right, first, first of all, stop checking stats. It looks like you got that look on your face, like you're getting a headache again. So. so <laughs> I see you trying to do research and talk, and you know what happens when that happens, Sean. You know what happens when that. Don't do that. So, so stop doing it. Never that. goes well. It never but, goes uh, well. <laughs> so I uh, no, I, I, I my stats were, were were good with the Orioles except for the walks. I was a, I was again. I never really. It took me a long time to get my feet on the ground. I was able to make pitches. I had this uncanny ability when I was younger to make pitches when I had to make them. So I'd walk the bases loaded with one out, and then I'd come up with the two best sliders of my night to punch a guy out. You know, it was it was one of those things. But when you have Frank Robinson as your manager, who I come up and Frank Frank's my manager when I get to the big leagues. Right? Oh my god! Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, no, not good. Not what good was at Frank? All. Was he intimidating? Let me tell you something. Intimidating is not the word, but I will say that I get up there. The first guy meets me. He goes, "Oh, he says Frank hates pitchers. Stay away from Frank." The next guy says, "Hey." Frank can't stand pitches. Just stay away from him. I'm like, oh, my these guys know I'm a pitcher, right? They're not making it any better. So I can't believe I'm not bold as Kelly's policy right now. So, so I come up, and for some reason, Billy Ripken grabs me after like a week, right? And Frank welcomed me. I went in his office. You, know, you go to the manager. You get called up first time. You walk in his office. That's when he asked me if I wanted to pitch or take the night off or whatever. I said, no, I'm, I'm good, Frank. I'll pitch or whatever. He said – after about a week, Billy Ripken says, I really don't know why, but Frank really likes you. Now, I don't want to trust that for the for a second. So I, I see Frank and I'm going the other way. If the other way is the woman's bathroom, I'm going in the woman's bathroom. So I see Frank coming. I'm just staying out of his way. But um, the best part is when you're pitching and you're young and you're scared to death and you're going 3 0 on every hitter and then you're going 3 1 and then a foul ball. And then another foul ball and your pitch count is 88 in the top of the second. And the manager is walking up and down the dugout, throwing his hands up like, what's this guy doing? He's screaming at the pitching coach. And you're on the mound. It makes you feel so much better. Like I was so, <laughs> I was so much more comfortable when Frank was yelling at me from the dugout, you know, my own manager. So thank, I thanks so much. I had Jamie Quirk when I first came up. JQ was awesome. And I had Bo Mel, Bob Melvin. And those guys. Oh, yes, so, Melvin. They, they were so good to me. Bo Mel is my boy. I love that guy. He's just awesome. 
So awesome. he was he was your catcher. Yeah, yeah, he oh. was he was the like the Sunday guy, the backup guy. We had Mickey Tettleton was in the middle of that Fruit Loops thing. I don't know if you remember that's that. Right. That's that's right. That's right. He was hitting like out of the blue. He was hitting like dirty home runs. And Mickey was a good guy, tough guy from Oklahoma, good catcher. But he didn't. He wanted to like catch the, the Dave Schmitz and the Jeff Ballards of the world who were gonna you know look on the outside corner and kind of get it within a ball's width of the outside corner. I was looking at the outside corner and he was jumping for it. <laughs> so he didn't like me very much. So they started to, we butted heads. We actually had a couple of run-ins on the mound, me and Mickey. Oh, oh yeah. did you really? Oh, what, yeah. what, ha- them, what happened? What happened? One what happened? Them, one of them I remember, I remember vividly because Frank came running out to the mound to like break it up. We were going to have like this fight in the middle of the game with my catcher. That was awesome. So, what did he say? What did he say? I, I don't like, know. What was happening? Out, he came out, and I, I guess I was bouncing the breaking ball again, whatever, my breaking ball. And I threw a hard breaking ball, so it was like – it was a hard downer. So if it was bouncing, it was going to take a piece of flesh with it on the way by if you weren't blocking it very good. And Mickey could hit. Not the greatest defensive guy in the world. You know, didn't like to block stuff and have to chase stuff, you know. So uh, he's like, he's like, we got to go. He goes, I just shook off the – you know, I had – I think George Bell was up or whatever. And Frank's like, we're not throwing fastballs to George Bell, so – I shake the fastball. He puts the fastball down again. I shake. It's like base loaded two outs in the sixth inning of tie game or whatever. And I go, uh, I shake it again. He puts it down again. I shake it again. He puts it down again. I step off. I'm like, time out. He comes running out. He's like, we're throwing the fastball right here. I go, what? We're throwing? I've never had a catcher like, like I'm out of my mind. You know how I was on the mound, right? Like oh, I was, my God. I was, uh, scary. Like it was scary, dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah, scary. Like you couldn't. <laughs> Like, it was bad, you know? Like, every catcher I've ever had said, I, I really thought we were fighting at, at some point, you know, <laughs> just trying to have a conversation, and I want to fight him, you know what I mean? So I was kind of like, you know, once I got into the game and my, I got the adrenaline flowing and I was competing, it was like, just stay away from me kind of, you know? I'll be a nice yeah. guy tomorrow, but I'm kind of going to be a jerk today. So um, he came out, and we started. I said, I'm, I said, I don't give I don't give a crap what you do. I'm throwing a slider, so put down whatever you want. And then he was like, You're not you're you rookie, you're not gonna tell me that, you know. And then we're going, now you see, clear as day, you can see our heads going like this back and forth. Up, 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 up. You know, we screamed. Like I I really I was gonna like hit the guy, he was bigger than me, so I don't know how I don't know how it would have worked out, but it would have been interesting to see a pitcher and catcher fight each other on the same team. How'd the brawl start? Pitcher and catcher for Oh, they did? Uh, what was he throwing at him? No, they're the same team. So <laughs> only one dugout empty. You ever see a fight where only one dugout empty is ours? <laughs> so it was going to be the first time that ever happened. But anyway, so, so uh, yeah, we got into it. So Frank comes running out. He goes, ah, what the hell's going on? This is so, uh, you guys, this is bullshit, blah, blah, blah. The games, you got to, I don't even know what. Frank started yelling. And all of a sudden, we were both like, oh, okay, okay, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were just I just kidding, Frank. We were just kidding. And then just so we had to tap, we'd tie a nice bow around the story, I thought a slide to punch him out and walk off the field. <laughs> <laughs> and I screamed at him walking off the field. Then we got into it in the dugout again. Oh, my God. You did? did oh, no, yeah. no, no punches were thrown, though. Not my proudest moment, but not my least proudest moment either. <laughs> A young Pete Harnish. I, I was with you with a veteran Pete Harnish. I was like, this guy's crazy. A young Pete Harnish, I'd be like, this guy's going to rip somebody's head off. I actually have papers. I have papers that certify that I'm crazy. <laughs> if you want to see them, I can go get them. But... <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. So, Peter, when you, you end up going to the Astros in 91, and, you know, first off, what was that like? And also, that was your that was your all-star year. I, I'm sorry, I'm doing stats and talking because I got to talk about this one. Dude, you were 12 and 9 with a 2-7, 33 starts because you were always a workhorse, dude. That's one thing I loved about you. But, dude, how about this, how about this stat change? 216 in each pitch, 169 hits. Unbelievable. Like, basically was missing barrels at a r- ruthless rate. I, right. so, I don't like the fact that you seem so surprised by that. It's very <laughs> that like, dude, that's. That's unbelievable. I tell, people, I tell people all the time, this is crazy, right? Because I no one threw more fastballs than me. You know that. You played first base yeah. behind me enough times. Yeah. You know. No one challenged, no, you know, I don't I say challenge, whatever. No one threw more fastballs percentage wise than me, maybe in the history of the game, except for maybe Sid hmm. Fernandez. And we were always one two for a four or five year stretch. We were like one two in the National League battling for like batting average against, you know. Right. Um I just had that ride. You know, I, I'm sure you faced me at what in spring training, maybe. Did we ever face each other in a real game? You and me? Check. Yeah, I don't think so. No, dude, no. I came over. I was a rookie in 98 when you were with the Reds. Yeah. 
you would have been one it? of those guys they said take it easy on. So I would have, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have had to dial it back anyway. It wouldn't have been really fair. But um, the um, yeah, it was it was uh, yeah, that was my thing. I walked up, I walked more than you'd want to walk generally, but uh, I didn't get up a lot of hits. So I tell people all the time, you know, you want to categorize my my uh, career. I tell them, I say, I used to tell the guys, this is funny when I started coaching, we'll get into that in a little bit. But when I started coaching pro ball, I used to tell the guys, Hey, listen, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I wasn't a hall of famer and I didn't suck. So wherever you want to put me in between, <laughs> wherever you want to put me in between there, I'm good with you want to say I was good. You want to say I was average. You want to say I was above average below. I really don't care. I didn't get in the hall of fame and I didn't suck. Period. Hey, <laughs> we'll, we'll, I, We'll That's get how into I some. Bow around my career. No, wait, <laughs> we'll get into some batter pitcher stuff in case in case will ask you who you owned and all that later. But case, I got to tell you this: the guys you faced the most in your career with that ERA under four, Mark Grace, Ron Gant, Sammy Sosa, Grissom, Gary Sheffield, Fred McGriff, Pendleton when he was an MVP, Tony Gwynn, Larry Walker, Ray Lankford, Tony Fernandez, Barry Larkin, Dante Bichette. So those are like the greatest players of your generation are the ones you faced the most. Everybody had at least 47 plate appearances against him, Case. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah, plus they were all on steroids. No. <laughs> that, I mean, no, no. So? I'm just, right. scratch that. I'm, you know, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding. But we were in this. We were in the PED area. I mean, it's it's widely known now. Right. So, you know, I, I pitched against some guys that were definitely getting some help. And you could clearly see me at the pool in my thong. And no, I wasn't getting any help. <laughs> when you face Conseco, when you face Conseco in like '89, when he was like just a monster, were you thinking this guy's definitely doing something? Uh, yeah, he wasn't a great high fastball hitter. <laughs> Same thing yeah. with McGuire. Um, Conseco was a little better with the high. Fit. McGuire was a dead low ball, you know, unbelievable low ball guy. You, yeah. you know, the plane, the plane of his swing or whatever. Oh yeah. Um, but it's um, like a so golf McGuire, swing. McGuire, I really, I mean, he got a few hits here or there. I don't think he ever hurt me. I know he did hit one ball when I was young in Oakland. They were both batting back to back in Oakland. Oh my God. You know, the Bash Brother days? The Bash Brothers, yeah. I had the Carney poster Lansford. on my wall. Yeah, Cody yeah. Lansford was like winning the batting title, leading <clears> all. Uh, the Bash Brothers were three and four. You know, it was like ridiculous team. I remember he hit one like, uh, there's the, there was those steps in the old Oakland Stadium in left center field. It was wide open with a, a big a set of concrete steps going over. Yeah, all they the way still up. have them. They still have them, yeah. Oh, they do? Yeah. I don't know. I think there's 9,000 steps and he hit like the 8,000. <laughs> <laughs> and Rocky wouldn't even run up there to get the ball back. We tried oh to get the best Stallone to run up there. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was, it was not good. Oh, that first year, Peter, when you were in, when you were in Houston, you went to the all-star game, you know, you yeah. got any good, you got any good. All, I know you threw a, you threw a, a one solid inning two one, two, three inning real nice. What was, what was any all-star game stories for us? What do you remember from that all-star game? Other than post game, I completely bitched that I should have been the MVP and I went to the store. <laughs> and I tried to get that changed. I don't know what, was, what they were thinking about. I was like 22 years old and I threw a scoreless inning with a punch out. I punched out Ruben Sierra, and I'm like, hey, MVP, send me that car over here. Back then, it was like, a, you know, it wasn't a Kia Sorento. It was like a Toyota Pre a Honda Prelude or something. But I said, give me that Prelude, dude. I want to drive that thing back. We're in Toronto. I can get it over the border. But, uh, yeah, no MVP was just ridiculous. Uh, uh, other than that, the, the funny thing was, at the All-Star break, my record was 5-7. and seven. I Listen to this. Wow. It's really interesting. Five and seven with like a one, like a one seven eight or a one eight one or something like that. So oh I get God. to the All Star game and uh, you know there was throngs of media around my locker. Um, so <laughs> there was the one reporter I talked to because I think everybody else had gone home. But um, the one reporter came over and said, "Hey, I got something for you. Do you know that you've had? I think he told me nineteen starts in the first half or eighteen, something like that, just under twenty. He said, "Do you know?" that six of your starts, the final score of the game was one to nothing. What? The final score of the entire game was one to nothing in, in one third of my first half starts. We, I won two. I had two shut, two one nothing shutouts. I lost two and I had two no decisions that were like nothing, nothing after seven or eight or whatever. Crazy, right? That'll wow, never be done crazy. again. That'll never oh, be man. done again. Six games that I started in the first half of the season and the final score was one to nothing. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, crazy. Crazy. That's crazy. Crazy. I didn't know. Wow. 
So thank you and, to that one reporter who had nothing better. <laughs> I think he was, it might have actually even been an imposter. I don't even think it was a real reporter. <laughs> Hey, I, th- that's a good question though, because nowadays, you know, you looked at a couple years ago, Degrom wins the wins the uh, Cy Young with a ten and nine record, and you know, people yeah. are you know sometimes you know you hear guys say, well, the wins the win doesn't really matter because of this and that. Like, what is your feeling on that, brother? Like, because you know, for your, our generation, the wins that was a big deal. You win twenty wins, that's a big deal. But like nowadays, they say, well, there's so much, you know, you, the bullpen could do this and that. You know, what what is your opinion on the win? Is it still a a factor there's a couple things back then back then the win was a much bigger factor the game has totally changed now i mean th- to win a game you have to go first of all the starter has to go five innings which is like considered like a you know quality outing now to go five innings right. and then the, the 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 third setup guy has to do his job the second setup guy has to do his job the lefty in the eighth inning has to get his two lefties out and then the closer has to get his three outs for you to get a win so you know, with the game, the way it's done now is so different. But I, back when I played, I felt like my job was to get – first, when I first started out, my job was to pitch eight innings and get the ball to the closer. We had closers when I got to the big leagues. There was closers. Right. Then the eighth inning guy came in, and it was like, you know, get into the seventh, eighth inning and give your team a chance to win. That's how I really approached every game. I think you know me well enough that yeah. I, wanted, I wanted the ball and I wanted to give my I, – I wanted my teammates, the other 24 guys on my team, and my manager and my coaching staff to know that I did everything I could between starts to put them in the best position when it was my night to go out there to get a win. So if I could get the team into the set, obviously I wanted to win more games. You know, I had a slightly above you, you mentioned it earlier, slightly above 500 record. Um, the teams I played on were well below 500 for my career. So, you know, I feel like I got a pretty good amount out of that where there's some, you know, those Houston, those first couple of years in Houston, we couldn't hit it all. I told you, you know, to play six one nothing games in the first half of the season was just ridiculous. But that was my job. That was my aim. My aim was to go seven, eight innings and give 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 the team a chance to win the game. And uh, wherever it fell, sometimes I got lucky and we had the lead and I got the win. Other times you'd have the lead and they'd cough it up and we'd still win the game in extra innings, but you wouldn't get the win. You know, it was – but now wins for starting pitchers have become – they're just not – they're just not that – I don't think they're that important. But do you think do you think the starting pitcher thinks it's important or not really? Oh, oh. as far as the starting <clears> pitcher, <throat> yeah, I'm sure they all you know go out there to get wins. But I, I have to say, you know, the the way the game has gotten analytically and the way people use bullpens now and and all the the stuff, which I think you know there very there's value in the numbers. We could talk about this all day. We're not going to, but right. um, I think there's value in the analytics. I really do. But I think they're over overall they're hurting the game. I think it's not not a great product out there. But um, the, it's like I see guys, they, they want to know how many, you know, I, I coached in the minor leagues and big leagues, all levels for 12 years. I just stopped last year. And these guys are coming out of games. I wonder how many pitches they got after four innings. I got 58 pitches after four innings. I'm like, yeah, when we, when the manager comes out, takes the ball out of your hand, you're done. Like, what, what are you, you're counting? Like, I never counted pitches. I was right. going out to, to try to take me out of a game. I'd be like, you're out of your mind. You're not taking me out of this. <laughs> you know, and I would be honest if I was tired, if I was tired and gassed and I thought I wasn't the best option, I didn't do it much because I was a little stubborn. I'm not going to lie to you, but I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm gassed, you know, it's six innings, 120 pitches tonight. And I just, you know, I left it all out there and probably better off going a different direction. They'd ask. And I, and, and I think I earned the respect that, that I'd be honest with them. And like I said, nine times out of 10, I was like, I'm in and you're not taking me out of this game, but there's not that, there's not that player anymore. Those, there's not those players. I don't want to speak in absolutes. That would be ridiculous. But right. gen- generally, those players aren't there anymore. And then there's only there's a handful of guys. I see guys. And you can tell. Yeah. You watch the game. You can tell these pitchers that want the ball and you're not taking them out until yeah. the game. Yeah, like sure, Scherzer pops into your head. Like, they ain't taking Scherzer it. Scherzer yeah. is the first one I see. The Grom's yeah. another one I see. You know, <laughs> But these guys are – they turn into dinosaurs, man. It's it's such a small percentage yeah. of guys now that, that want the ball and literally want to go – it's like, uh, well, I got 62 pitches and, uh, you know, I threw 92 last time in five innings and I had the bases loaded twice. So those were high stress innings. So I don't want to go over 65. I'm like, yeah, no, just keep going. We'll tell you when you're done. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, this right. is, these are honest conversations. You have a right. it's like ridiculous. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pete, you, you being a coach, you know, for the last 12 years, like you said, big leagues, minor leagues, all that stuff. And the analytics have become a big part of the game. What, what are some of the analytics that you were like, okay, I could use that. That, that, that's something I'm going to use to talk to the pitchers about. 
Okay. Um, very, very good question. So it, I was very important. My, my big thing is extension. You know, I love these guys like Logan Gilbert, this kid. I don't know. You watch this kid pitch. He's an animal. I had him in the minor leagues. Great kid. Uh, came out of Stetson, first round pick, six, six, five, you know, throws 95, 96, plays up over 100. He gets to touches almost eight feet of extension, which is ridiculous. You know, wow. like six feet's good, seven feet's unreal. Eight, he gets up. I've seen 7 11 on track, man. So I want to know what kind of extension guys get. I want to know release height, um, release side, because those are things you can track with somebody's sore or their, um, their arms tired. Their, their, their release height starts coming down. Their arm starts dropping. Yeah. There be something wrong, you know? These are valuable, valuable things. Uh, I want to know spin rates. I want to know vertical break, you know, amount of vertical break, horizontal break, because you want to know what the, the pitches are shaped like. That's important stuff. Where the analytics lose me is now they're using them to dictate pitch usage. And by that, I mean, and this is very important if we have a minute or two to talk about this. Yeah, stuff. yes, please um, do. You, you go into the major leagues now, they, major leagues, minor leagues, everywhere, in pro ball right now, they will tell guys, you have a, a plus major league slider. Throw the slider. So, yeah, the guy has a plus slider. It's great. Yeah, I think it's great. He should use a slider. The guy with a good breaking ball should use his breaking ball. But they, want, they will tell them, you're under the gun. Throw the breaking ball. Now, my issue with that is, and this is clearly a no one has been able to give me a good answer to this or a reasonable answer is that these guys are not robots they're not machines. So, so if I, 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 I was out there and, and I'm a life experience guy, I used to tell the kids in the minor leagues, they laugh. I said, whatever you're going through mentally right now, I did it. I pitched long enough that I've been in your state. I've either positive, negative confidence, low confidence, medium confidence. Don't like your delivery. Don't like your breaking ball. Been through all of it. I've been through. I know everything. And I used to talk in life experience. That's what I did. But I don't want a kid who's 2-2, came in in the seventh inning and at second and third in a one-run game, and it's it's uh, second and third, 2-2 count, and he's got the plus slider, and they're telling him, you have to throw the slider right now. He might have got the second and third because he gave hung a slider for a single, and the next guy hung a slider and hit a double. I don't want that guy throwing his slider with the game on the line and two outs. You know what I mean? What? He's mentally fried. He's like – my last three sliders I've hung and they want me to throw the slider and they will say, throw the slider because percentage wise, it says it's good. Now, percentage wise to me. Okay. Does the guy have a great slider? He throws it 70% of the time. What if the bases are loaded and it's two, two and I don't know, judge is hitting and then and you have a one run lead and he throws the 30% one. That's terrible. Like everybody throws, like, I don't want to hear average anything. Like if you have an average slider, there's no average slider. Nobody throws that. You, so you throw above average sliders and you throw below average sliders and you have an average. Like average isn't even a thing. They constantly go against, they go against average. Like, like, is it above average, below average? Is it way above average or way below average? There's no average. Because if you on a scale of 1 to 10 can throw a 9.5 slider, you can actually still throw a 2 slider, right? It comes right. out of your hand, you spin it in there. You love that stuff. When guys tried to back foot you and it, and it backed up in the middle of the plate, you – probably made a zillion dollars hitting those pitches, right? Yeah. I don't want that kid. If he's not committed and ready to throw his, if he's not totally committed to the slider, I want him throwing the heater. I was out there a bunch of times with no breaking ball. It's like, oh, scratch. And, and you wouldn't totally go, you try to try to get the feel back for it, right? Because I got to throw seven innings. I don't want to just keep pumping heaters in there, but it's like, all right, a few more splits tonight and, and we're going to move the heater around a lot more, right? I don't have the breaking ball. Like, <laughs> right. you have to make adjustments. Nobody's the same person every single time. And the analytics, they don't recognize any human error. There's no, there's no human to it. They're all numbers. All the pitches are numbers. And if he throws this, if, his, if this is his average slider, this is the way he's going to – if he has an above-average slider, he'll throw it like that. I go, no, nah, be careful because he won't throw it like that. And if right. he's a little stressed and he's a little under the gun. So when they get the pitch usage, when they become taking analytics and start dictating pitch usage, I don't mind they take analytics and say, this guy can really spin his curveball. And you say to the kid, hey, you know, you got kind of a special curveball. You got good spin. You should be doing that. I, I want a kid to recognize what he's good at. I want him to be pumped up and confident in what he's good at. I don't want him feeling like you have to throw the curveball, you know, 38% of the time tonight because he might be in the bullpen bouncing the curveball and throwing it over the catcher's head. And in which case, I don't want him throwing it at all. <laughs> right. I mean, that's just logic, right? Yeah. 
But right. all that goes out the window. And these guys, they're out of their minds. But it's circling back. You watch. Yeah. It's going to circle back. They're going to start getting some more human people in that kind of they kind of understand life experience people who have been through the game and can really relate stuff to people message wise. It's, it's important. You know? Yeah. Well, it's funny because the human element of the analytics, I know for me, like even just being in the plate, trying to like, I, you know, dumb down, like dumb down to the C and hit it, pick a quadrant, raise my sights, lower my sights. Like I didn't need, I, I just didn't need too much information in my mind. And I'd also didn't need, and some days, Hey, I, 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 the bat felt so heavy, you know, I had to cheat, you know what I mean? Or, or I had to, you know, I had to go get the ball. I had, maybe I was a pull guy today, man, my, my, uh, my hamstrings tight. So I don't feel great. Maybe I'm, you know, just, just so many different reasons why the analytics wouldn't work for me sometimes as a hitter. So I can see as a pitcher, like, yeah, no, have you ever been out there on the mound to the analytics guy when you don't have your slider or you don't have your breaking ball? You don't want to throw it, even though on paper it says this is your best pitch. It's it's that is just logic to me. What you just all that is logic, right? Yeah. The analytics probably wouldn't have loved you. Your launch angle probably wasn't where it should be, right? right exactly. I mean, you had a lot of power at time. You know, you had yeah. situational power, but you weren't a power guy. You were a, a yeah. line, You know, the analytics yeah. wouldn't have liked you, and you had an unbelievable career, and you hit three hundred. I don't know, forty seven right. times in the big leagues. So. Right. um it's 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 just unfathomable to me. Like I said, the analytics. I'm, I don't want to kill analytics in general. I, I don't want to do that because there's value in the. Information. There's a place for it. Yeah, there's a place for it. There's value in the information. When people start dictating pitch usage, especially people who never played, um, and, and I, that's such a cliche to say that, but like there's value in when you've been in situations in every situation and you've been two two, and the cleanup hitter who's an all star, ten time all star, is in the box. And it's two and two and the bases are loaded and you got a one run lead. And it's like, Hey, it's me or you right here. I got to make a pitch or you got to make a swing. Analytics can't help you at that point, but, but they can actually hurt you because if they're telling me I have to throw a certain pitch and I don't have any confidence in that pitch. I used to tell the kids when they went out to start a game in the minor leagues, we go in the bullpen and walk in. Cause I was in uniform in the dugout, you know, and I didn't talk to him much during the game, but we walk in from the bullpen. I say, and they all knew it after a while. Cause I say the same thing. I say, you know what I want you to do tonight? They're like, uh, you know, at first they'd be like, throw a shutout, strike out 10. I'd be like, no, I want you to throw 100 committed pitches. Go out and throw me 100 pitches that you're committed to, and I'll take my chances. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Full commitment to every pitch. You t- it's hard to do. It's a very hard thing to do. It's very easy to talk about. It's a very hard thing to do. But I would tell them. And then if there was a situation, they, I thought they threw the wrong pitch in a game, and, you know, maybe they – hung a breaking ball and gave up a freaking big double to drive in a couple runs. I wasn't that guy. And I've seen pitching coaches do it. I wasn't that guy to jump in their face and be like, what are you doing? That's stupid. We talked about it. What are you throwing that for? I say, tell me why you threw that pitch in that spot. And if they had a reason for it, they were committed to it. You know what I mean? Mm, If they say, well, you know, I threw a good one to the last guy. I thought I could bounce it again, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I used to tell them, you're never going to hear from me as far as that was a stupid pitch. You'll never hear those words. I will always ask you, why did you throw that pitch? If you say because the catcher called it or because, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to shake the catcher. Then I'm going to have a problem, right? Because right. You, you're not committed to that. If the catcher calls something, you want to shake him and you don't shake him. You're not committed to that pitch. Whatever that pitch is, you're not committed to it. So I used to tell him, throw me 90 to hundred committed pitches and I'm all good with it. So we talk about that. that. That's the stuff we talked about. That's the important stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. I love it. I got one quick case. You you talk about the human element so much. And then earlier you're talking about, oh, this umpire versus that umpire. What's your take on them going robo umpire? Like, what does that take away from Mm. the game in in your opinion? You're asking me? Yeah. Yeah. I actually like that. Um, I'm not. Yeah. Well, Well, look. The days of, um, how do I say this? In my opinion, when we played the human element, I knew the umpires that were pitchers umpires. I knew the umpires that were hitters umpires. I knew the guys who were low ball umpires. John McSherry, the late John McSherry, uh, bless his heart, great man, comes to mind. He was a low ball. I loved John McSherry. We had a wonderful relationship as far as a player and an umpire could have. He was from Staten Island. We were New York guys. He always liked me, but he could he he would not call the pitch that was – around the groin or the belt area. And that's where I lived. 
I had trouble hitting the knees. He was a low ball guy. You wanted to be a sinker ball, you know, pitcher with John McSherry. I knew all of that stuff. No one knew the umpires. Scott Service laughs. We still talk about it. No one knew the umpires. I used to look at the umpires and I'd be pitching in three days. And I looked around all the box scores to see who was at first base because I knew those were the guys I might get at home plate. And uh, I knew the guys I wanted. You know, the Hirschbecks were great. You could walk them off, you know. And that's Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz. That's all the, all the good pitchers in my year. They made their money going as far off as they could, you know, taking it as far out as they could. And then they get to a point where they couldn't go that far. Casey knows it was frustrating yeah. to him. As a hitter, it was frustrating. But Craig Biggio used to always scream about, call, just call the strike zone. And the, he said, he always used to bitch you. I wish they'd just call the strike zone that's in the rule book. And I'm like, yeah, no, you don't want that. You'd never get another hit. He said, <laughs> what are you talking about? I said, I'll just throw all fastballs at your armpits. And you, exactly. You literally won't hit one of them. <laughs> You'll pop up every at-bat or strike out. I said, you do not want him to call a rule book that's in the strike zone. So fast forward, now they have these things where they have a robo-umpire behind the umpire, right? They're, they're double-checking. They have the box. They have the Quest Tech, whatever, you know, whatever they're using now. I don't even know. I don't watch that much baseball. Uh, I was hoping you guys would clue me in on with the good teams. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, maybe we can go over standings in a little while. But, um, uh, you know, so, so now I feel like it's – now I feel like it's the human element, but in the back of the umpire's minds, these guys are, these guys are evaluated regularly now. Like, they, they come out and say I, – I saw – it was a few weeks ago. They were talking about it on, on the radio, on the MLB network somewhere, on the radio. And they were talking about that an umpire, some young guy, never heard his name. You, Case, I'm sure you covered the story or whatever. He missed two pitches out of, uh, I think they said 260 something pitches in the game. He missed two pitches out of two six, which is like the greatest game of all wow. time. But wow, these guys now they're umpiring. Now they know there's no human element anymore because now they got over their shoulder is the Quest Tech, the stuff that we're talking about. So why not just take it out and have them call the real? You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I'm not. I, I'm not anti. I'm not pro. I don't care. But I, I, I think it would be interesting. Mm. I just feel like the human element of the game, like, hey, listen, if I'm playing first base and I botch a ball, I don't say, like, let me do it over. I botched it. You know what I mean? Like, I botched the ball. I'm a human. I, I, I punched out. I popped it up. The umpire is the umpire. You know, like you said, back when we were first coming up, before they went to the Quest Tech, you know, everybody had their, you know, you knew Joe West. I love Joe West because he was a he was a hitter's umpire. The, the strike zone was so small. Sure, and and if you were a young Joe. kid, if you were a young kid and you and you made a motion to Joe West, I'm like, oh hell yeah, the freaking zone just went to the, as big as a Dixie cup. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I was that guy a few times. Joe West and I would Were you? <laughs> Great guy though at Pebble Beach. He would go. He used to come to the golf tournament in Pebble Beach every year, and he play. Uh, he plays uh, golf in uh, cowboy boots with spikes on the bottom. <laughs> Dude, he, does. A, he Joe, really does. He does. Joe is a great guy. A I think play. he's a great, great umpire too. But he was, you know, he would, he would for pitchers. He was not your friend if you would uh, make a motion to him. You know. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I understand that, and let's not kid ourselves. You box a lot of balls at first base. I've seen. You <laughs> Uh, Dude, hey, I remember my, no, I remember my rookie year in '98. We're at Candlesticks and Pete's pitching, and I'm holding on. Uh, Base is loaded, right? And I must admit, early on in my career, like going to my right, I was a little, I was a little nervous. A little, I was a little nervous. <laughs> and Barry Bonds hits me like a 47 chopper to my right, and I like totally alligator arm, and I just miss it. I, I think I took three inches to my right and just missed it. Two runs score, blah, blah, blah. And, like, Pete says to me, uh, you know, we come in after the inning. You could tell. I, I was, like, pissed at myself. I'm like, idiot. Like, you should have had that ball. Jeez. And Pete comes in after the inning. He's like, hey, he's like, uh, you know, you don't have to be scared of it. You know, he says something like that. Like, you don't, it's not going to hurt you if you if you go get it, Case. I'm like, all right, take it easy, Jim Palmer. Jesus Christ. I'm like, <laughs> I the only way I only remember that because I remember you reaching for that ball like you reach for the check at lunch every day. <laughs> I know, but you guys got to oh talk about God. those teams, those ninety seven, ninety eight teams. Well, dude, I, I tell yeah, you what, I, talking about the talk, talking about the check, I still talk. You know, to this day, I was who was I talking to the other day was saying, you know, t things are changing in the big leagues as far as guys teaching guys how to be pros and passing the buck. But I remember Pete, like, still so grateful, dude, coming up with the Reds, like. You taking all the whole team. Pete would take the whole team. You know, we go to Chicago, go to Geno's East. We'd have the whole team too. We'd have like twenty guys, you know. And Pete would always pick up the check. And 
everywhere we went, he would pick up the check. And, and I remember like thinking, oh man, no, let me get this. Meanwhile, I was making no money. I, I was up begging, begging. He said, no, I got it, you know? But he, but he was like, you know, Pete was like, no, pay it forward. When you start making money, you pick up the check for those guys. And I remember I, st- I would tell the guys when I was started making some money and I'd pick up the checks, hey, Pete Harnish picked up the check, you know, when I was coming up and kind of, you know, paid it forward. You know, Pete, who were the guys that paid it forward for you? Like, how did you learn that? You know, how did you learn that system? Uh, no one, actually. I'm going to need some of that money back. <laughs> <laughs> you guys owe me $983,000. So <laughs> you guys figure it out and let me know. <laughs> um, no, I think I just stole everything. I just, I just sat down and had lunch and ran out. I came when I came up to the big leagues. Quite honestly, when I came up to the big leagues, there was no. Uh, it was a young team. The Orioles had a very young team. Um, yeah. I didn't. I didn't have. Uh, I mean, Cal Ripken was there, but I wasn't eating lunch with Cal Ripken a whole lot. You know? so, <laughs> he he uh, super guy, but um, he was eating. Know, he was eating by himself back in those days, wasn't he? Like, didn't he like kind of roll yeah, by Billy, himself? Billy was there too. Yeah, okay, him so, and Billy. You know, him and Billy, but uh, talk about yeah. two polar opposite guys. Billy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love Billy's awesome, man. Billy's the best. Great. He's, He's the, the guy best. Be like, Frank likes you, and I just don't understand it. <laughs> 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 I'd be like, yeah, well, whatever. It's better than I'm not like him. <laughs> but, um, yeah, those guys were, were polar opposite. But a very young team, like even Billy. Billy barely had a year in. It was all guys just getting to the big league. So we, I pretty much hung out with the call-up guys. Me and Kurt and Bobby Malacky went out to, to lunch. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'd all pool our $3 and go to Crystal <laughs> Burger. Go to the pub. There was no, you know, case. We used to, remember we used to say, okay, we're meeting in the lobby, 1245, getting a cab, go yeah. to have lunch, and then 2 o'clock to the ballpark, right? We used to yeah. To oh, yeah. We used to always, always. I hate that those days are over, man. I'm in big league clubhouses, and I see guys go, there's a, there's a chef with a lunch now, and they – they grab some lunch and go back to their locker and eat lunch in their lock. You know, there was no more of those, you know, even if you went to Hula, Pittsburgh, we used to go to hula hands right down by the water. Yeah. Remember that on the, yeah. on the river there or whatever. Um, you know, all the St. Louis, we go up on the uh, Italian place. I can't remember the name of it with the fried ravioli. We go on the hill. In oh St. yeah. Louis. That place is awesome too. Yeah. It was awesome. Like we had all, we had all our spots. Spots. And yeah. Stuff, and we'd spend an hour and a half together in a, and we, we 15 minutes in a cab, hour and a half at lunch. 15 minutes at a ballpark and you, you know, you yeah. were with six, five, six, seven guys every day. You know, it was yeah. talking about last night's game, tonight's game, you know, whatever it was. Um, those days have kind of yeah. gone away. You know, that's how you, that's, well, that's how you get to know the guys too. That's how you get, that's how you look out on the field and go, Oh man, you know, we spent a lot of time off the field. I got that guy's back. I actually know him. Cause I've spent time with him, you know. You told he me one me other a chili dog today. He bought me a chili dog. <laughs> he bought me a chili dog. Yeah, I Dude, would you say talk... you dive, but you. I never wanted you to dive for anything. Quite honestly, I never really expected you to catch anything. <laughs> so anything you caught was just was awesome. It was that's, like gravy. That's not true. That's not true. Take it back. <laughs> I take think it back. I, I'm sorry. But I can't. I can't kill you on your own. On your hey, own I had Pokey. I had Pokey Reese to my right. The greatest, the greatest yeah. second baseman, and maybe I think defensively, True. maybe in the history of the game, I didn't have to move one step. Thank usually, God. thank you. <laughs> un, uh, un, unreal range. Pokey Reese had unreal range, and Barry Barry Larkin range at short. We had a nice team until yeah. until they pulled it over to uh, Willie Green or whatever. Jesus Christ! I oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sure, he's already been on the podcast. I'm sure I'm behind really green. So, he was. It's funny. He was on last week, and now me. That's <laughs> so good, dude. Let's go back to that '99 team, Pete, because that was my for for all the all the years I played in the big awesome. leagues, man. That was my favorite team ever. Like, where where does that team rank for you? I just it was it was so great the, the games that we won that we had no right winning that year you yeah. know what i mean like oh some it was eddie taubin's he one night pokey reese hitting a double yeah. with two outs off the closer one night it was dimitri young one night it was you know you regularly barry pulled his weight regularly yeah. you guys it was just amazing to me those games that we were to win 96 games and not get in the postseason oh painful was, it was just with oh. that group of guys it was we had gravy and sully remember sully 100 oh 100 sully was league. awesome yeah, I'm sure he's Scott been on the podcast. He's Scott Williamson? Podcast. No, he hasn't been on the podcast yet. Those you beat them. Uh-uh. You beat Scott Williamson and Scott Sullivan. I did. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, so those guys can't taunt me. 
I talked to Danny Graves last week. He was taunting me about it. Uh, I know he's he's been on eleven times. I said, "Oh, what's your name? <laughs> so that's good. He's an eleven timer. So, um, but yeah, we had that 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 season was so awesome, man. And it was like it didn't start off like magical. We were just okay, and we didn't realize what kind of team we had. But um, you know, I had a really good year. I think uh, who else? I'm trying to think of the star. Oh, R- Steve Ron Valone. De- yeah, Steve Paris had a great year. RV was awesome that year. Nagel, um, Nags, Nags. Oh yeah, Nags. What a nut job that guy. I love it. He's, <laughs> he's the best. Man. He's the best dude. I Danny love Nags. Nagel's beautiful. I'm sure he's been on the podcast seven times. He, <laughs> he, he, I love that guy. Uh, Abe, Abe was there, although he was. Abe was the best. Injury. Yeah. Abe is awesome. All the How Morris. football guys. You know. Yeah. All the fantasy football. Guys. I know, dude. The fi- the fantasy football is great too. We'll talk about that in a second. But oh, yeah. the last but- weekend, the last weekend to go into Milwaukee when Milwaukee didn't care, they had their cars packed. Oh, it's and painful. we had that. I, I tell you what, I tell people all the time. I blame the shares meeting. Nah, me too. Day, Thursday night, I said to Vony. Vony called it. I said, Vony, I don't think we need the shares meeting. I think we just win. We just get it done, and we'll figure it out later. And he's like, No, we got to have this thing. Blah blah blah. And I'm like. And it got ugly. Remember, there was some like guys, they didn't want to give the trainer a full share. I was like, what are we doing? Yeah, We're talking yeah. about, if we finish second place, it could be $6,000. What, what, what are we talking about here? And if it turns out to be, you know, you go deep in the playoffs and it turns out to be a hundred and something thousand dollars. Who cares? Like we're all going to like, we're all giving up six, seven grand to give a guy a hundred percent share. I mean, come on. So right. that shares meeting, I really think was our downfall. That's just my opinion. I don't know that, that no, no, dude, that, that shares meeting. We never should have had that shares meeting. I, I feel, I've always feel the same way. Like can't believe. And then, and then we, we were, you know, we were obviously hoping to win a, we had to win two games, I believe. And we're in right. But, with, yeah. but the fact that we had to use you for game for the last game of the year, and then, you know, nothing against Paris, but you know, they yeah. Paris in, in that one game playoff, they got to him early. You know, I just think that would have been different too. Cause we were facing lighter, you know? So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That, that it, it, isn't it, isn't it amazing, bro? 20 some years later, we're still, I, it's still, that's still like, dang, cause I love that team so much and we should have, we should have been in the postseason. I really believe that it pains me. Case, the way that team was playing when we got to Milwaukee on Wednesday night, wherever we played, I don't remember where we ended up yeah. on Wednesday night. We had Thursday, the off day, remember, because we did like a yep. little kind of miniature. We had to we ordered a spread to the hotel and did our yeah. shares meeting, had a little party. We had the off day on Thursday and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The way we were playing when we landed in Milwaukee, I think we, I don't even know, but it seemed like we had won 10 out of 12 or something like that. Yeah. We were tearing it up all September. We were unbelievable. To go and lose the first two games to that Milwaukee Brewers team that literally didn't even want to be there. They were all packed and ready to drive yeah. home yeah. was such a disappointment. Um, it, it, it was, it's, I still think about it. I'm like, how do we, because the Mets, the Met, we were at two game lead on the Mets. We yep. had to sweep the Mets. I mean, we had to, the Mets had to sweep and we had to lose two out of three to get the top. And the Ash and the Astros had to sweep too, right? We, we, we should have won the division, right? Well, we well, went, we were two back. Remember, we had the two game series in Houston. Yep. I, I beat, uh, uh, yeah, look at me taking all the credit again. <laughs> I, I take that back, but I just know the kind of pressure I was under and how well I pitched that night. On the Tuesday <laughs> Tuesday night in Houston, I beat Lima Time. Lima time. Yeah, Lima Time. That's right. Uh, and then uh, Wednesday, they whacked. So we were one game back. And then Wednesday, they whacked us to go two back. So we were two back for three to play, I remember vividly. Okay, so that was yeah. tough. And they were going to play somebody that was kind of out of it too, but we had a two game lead on the Mets, and the Mets had won like remember the Mets went crazy. They went they won nine or ten in a row to end the season yeah. to catch us to do that tie game. And they what beat a, the Pirates. They, they had to sweep the Pirates the with Pirates Brian Giles, home, and Brian Pirates Giles was hurt. Giles was yeah. hurt. Yeah, Pirates at home, and it was. And we remember we were in the locker room watching them win every night, and then yeah, because we had an eight hour rain delay, eight hour rain delay, the rain delay yeah. was uh, it was so we started at nine. 30 or 10 30 at night that game i had to sit yeah. around all, that was the worst start day of my life man that was oh, we watched every nfl nfl game remember we were like doing the fantasy football we watched every game yeah it was a must win it was just a great crazy 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 time but a great team dude there's so many great guys from those teams it was it was so much yeah. <laughs> excuse me excuse me excuse me it was so much fun um because yeah. tight um but dude it, um what was I going to say? Oh, I, one other thing I was going to say. One other, one other Pete Harness lesson, like so great. In, in, in the shower the one time in 2000, <laughs> I was hitting like, 
I was hitting like a buck fifty eight. I was so bad, and it I remember. Wasn't that high. <laughs> I, was, I remember i remember it was like and i was like a hundred i was like a good sample size in i must have been 150 out 200 at bats in or something late like that may, dude. it was yeah, it was, it was late may it was late may and i remember yeah. you were i don't know if you pitched that there or whatever because you were like the last guy in the shower and i walked in and <laughs> and tell me what your memory of the shower is was i on my hands or was i on my feet <laughs> no <laughs> I, I, well, you were on your. Pete had the greatest thing, Chinch. He would always get into a handstand to clean his behind. He'd be like, well, "We'd walk in, like, what the hell's hardest, dude? He's in a handstand in the shower. He's like, hey, you got to make sure you clean. You know, get, get it all clean." Yeah, they so don't. I think you, when I walked in the shower, I believe you were in a handstand. I think I was in a handstand. So we started talking because I didn't want to be rude and flip around in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> so I stayed on my hands, and uh, well. It felt good too. So I just stayed on my hands. <laughs> and uh, you, were, you were like, you were coming apart at the seams, dude. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, that was, I was, it was a major, like, anybody, if I had a five minute, not even five minutes, if I had a one minute video of you, that would tell people what this game can do to a human being. <laughs> like, um, that was the one time we didn't have to shear you because all the hair fell out on your back and everything. We didn't, we didn't even need to do the shearing. Remember we had to do the sheep shearing all the time. We didn't have to do it. You're you under so much stress that you had no hair on your back. And that's when we knew. I mean, I knew Yetis, dude. I knew Yetis. So, um, we, we, uh, I was, I was there and you were like just coming apart at the seams. And you were at, at one point, I didn't want to say nothing. Cause you were like, Oh, for four with, I think two vicious ground balls to the pitcher, a pop up to the third baseman foul, and a punch out with the bases loaded. And I, I was like, God damn, I'm actually a better hitter than this guy. That's my first thought. When you walk, when you walked in, I was like, I'm a better hitter. I'm actually more productive. My OPS is higher than this guy's, and I think it was. So, I, uh, I, I saw you like literally in tears. Like you were starting to to tear up, and I felt so bad. And I'm like, I gotta help this guy. How I help this guy. I really don't want to tell him what I really think of him because he sucks. And <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be a good teammate here. And I said, I don't remember what, what, what I said. Something you said. You said you're hitting you, like one fifty eight, right? You go. You go. That's, that's what, what I, I hit. hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said. I said, dude, that's what I hit. You're a three hundred hitter in the big leagues. <laughs> I said, snap the shit, snap out of it, and and uh, you'll go hit three sixty for the rest of the year, and you'll wind up two eighty, two ninety for the season. Is it going to be a Hall of Fame career year? Probably not, but. You're going to salvage shit. It'll turn around. Just I said, stop being a baby or something. I don't know. You know <laughs> well, no, you didn't like, say stop being a baby. You were actually like the back of the baseball. What, what do you usually, what did you oh, hit yeah, last yeah, year? Yeah. I said 330. You said, well, the back of the baseball card doesn't lie. He goes, you're getting 158 now. He goes, and then, and then you said, you're going to hit, you know, 380, 370, 380 the rest of the way, and you're going to be around 300 or somewhere around it. Maybe this year you're yeah. 290. You said that. And dude, I end up hitting three. 90 the rest of the year and i hit 315 for that season yeah who needs <laughs> 20 bombs yeah. Who needs I was like, all I was you like, need Harness was all right you a, all you need is an upside down naked starting pitcher <laughs> <laughs> oh my god there seems Dude, to be a speaking. theme around naked na naked pete Harness. i think i've heard that that phrase Dude. It was, well, one, of the, what the, one of the great Pete, Pete loved to be naked and he doesn't have like, he's not like Jack Diesel either. Like usually the guys that are Jack Diesel, like that guy's the reason to be naked. Pete, I'm like, Pete loves to be naked just cause he loves himself so much. You know what I mean? So, but the, the, the one, the one day, the one day I, the first day I get freaking traded to the Cincinnati Reds. I'm like, Oh man, I'm so nervous. It's like Pete's first day in Boston. I'm shit in my pants. Open up the door. Johnny bench is there. He's like, let's go. You're late for the season. I'm like, Oh, I don't know what to say. But then Next thing I know, I see this naked guy coming. I don't know Peter at the time. I'm like, who's the naked guy walking up? He's like, has anyone seen my toothbrush? Has anyone seen my toothbrush? And he's walking towards me. So I'm like, I, has anyone seen this guy's toothbrush? You know? And as, <laughs> as Pete walks by me, he's got his toothbrush hanging out his ass. And he just keeps on walking. Has anyone seen my toothbrush? Has anyone seen my toothbrush? <laughs> great. So I went from like Johnny Ben's yelling at me to like crying from like, who's this guy? This guy's unbelievable. He's fast. His toothbrush in his butt. I was going to my shower. I had to hold the towel in one hand, my wallet in the other. And then I went, I had no way to hold it. The funny thing about that is, dude, the funny thing about that is when you walk through, it's like 
you know, I did it like regularly, not every day, obviously, but right. You know, no. so the veteran guys, the guys I had played with been teammates <laughs> before, they don't even bat an eye. They don't even turn around. The young guys who were like new to the team, like you were in that spot, right? Were like, <laughs> you could see the look. They'd be like, "What? Uh, what did I get myself? In? <laughs> what did I get myself into?" You know, it was so good. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> Pete, I got to tell the story. It's one of the greatest. It's one of the greatest stories in the history of the game. Do you mind if you I tell it? And Do you mind me. if I tell? It? It's the greatest. It's seriously, in, in a clubhouse story, it has to be one of the greatest ones ever. Let me just ask you: Can there be a lawsuit? No. <laughs> I think you guys are safe. That's where my producer. If it's job. not going to be a lawsuit, you can tell it. I don't <laughs> okay. Oh my god! It's so great. So. <laughs> We used to, I mean, first off, if you haven't realized by now, Pete Harnish is one of the funniest human beings alive. And he was like that in the clubhouse. So he did it. He would do anything to keep it light and anything to have fun. And I think that's why when you go back and look at Pete's teams, like, you know, he was on a lot of winning teams and it's so funny. Like, uh, one of the things that we used to joke around was, you know, we obviously shower a lot, you know, and we'd be like, Hey, we're like, you gotta be kidding me. We're like, what would you, what would you, what would you rather have? Harnish's nutsack full of nickels or $5 million? It was like the big joke. It was the biggest <laughs> joke at the clubhouse. We're like, that was was Avery, like, hey, Avery started that stuff, man. Did he, did he, Avery, Avery started that Yeah, what did Avery say? What did Avery That's say? What he said. That's exactly what it was. That was the freaking thing. Yeah, so Avery was a beauty too. God, one of the greatest guys too. We had so many good guys in those teams, but Avery was like ahead. five million bucks or or Harnish's nutsack full of nickels. It was so <laughs> funny. So it was a joke for a couple years, and I think it was two thousand one. I'm getting ready for I'm getting ready for spring. I'm getting ready for to go to a, a spring game, and and uh, um, I'm, I'm 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 feeling something standing on a uh, on the uh, training table, and the, the the pitchers had these what what, 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 what was it? Piriformis wax machine. Yeah. It was, right. no, it was par paraffin wax bath. It was supposed to be like for, for bones. People put their feet or their hands in it. <laughs> it was supposed to be for bone health if you had like bone bruise or whatever. I don't know. Well, right. It was so, it was worthless. It was for it was for but you could make a you could make a wax mold out of like, you know, whatever. And so Pete I see where, uh, we're, look, going. I see where I, we're going. Do you mind if I tell it? No, I look no, over. I look. No I, I look over. I look over, and Pete is buck naked again, which he was twenty four seven, seven days a week in the clubhouse. Anyhow, he was buck naked with his balls in the wax, <laughs> and he was making. He was. He was. Ma and I said, "Oh my God, Pete, what are you doing?" He's like, "Hey, he's like, I just need ten minutes to hold it here, and I'm going to make a wax mold, and I'm going to see how much change we can fit in for the season." So, <laughs> hey. So, so two things. First, I want to be clear. I showered before I did that. <laughs> so I wanted to respect the paraffin wax bath. So, so there was full shower, and I made sure everything was clean. Now, the, the best part of the whole story, well, two best parts for me. One is uh, guys used to come in. Back then, there was no breakfast, so they all, we'd all stop at IHOP or a diner. Uh, remember that right. diner on the corner in Sarasota? That oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There? Oh, yeah. That place was great. The best. So everybody would go in there. So it would be like, you know, 13 28 for breakfast. So they come in, they throw their 72 cents in there. I once it hardened up, I put it in the top of my locker, they drop all their change. Everybody took their loose change and threw it in there. I made like 38, 38 or 42 dollars and change that spring. <laughs> so that was the one thing. And the in the process of it, dude, the funniest thing was Mark Mann. Mark Mann comes through the door. Our trainer, who was our trainer? He, yeah, Mark Mann was our assistant, yeah, our assistant trainer at the time. He goes and gets a cup of coffee. He comes, turns around. He comes walking through the training room door. He feels like the me on like on the desk, like up high. He turns, he looks, and he just looks at me, and he just shakes his head and goes, I guess I got to order some new wax. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best part about it was that he had to order a, he had to order a new five-pound block of paraffin wax. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> but we, so we but but we we had the paraffin wax was in your locker and we would put we would put we would put there would be a, you would be like eight and a third inning you know be on ESPN on there how would you do and then we look You'd in the back it. and there's a big thing of, of Harsh's nut wax in his locker <laughs> yeah. with changing it and we always said we always said at the end of the year it was five million dollars and five cents <laughs> and so. He, <laughs> It wasn't that big. You're exaggerating. <laughs> Dude, thank you Seven for letting me tell that. Dude. 
seven layers into the refrigerator overnight to get into the top of the locker. <laughs> and then got the, the funny part was, was guys, one guy, first it was one guy. They come in. I go, did you go to breakfast? Put your change in here. But they come in with like, loose change. And then, uh, and then like every single guy. I had to like empty it a couple times. You know, go to like the, the coin star machine over in public. <laughs> oh, oh my God, dude. Oh my God. So, it was great, so great. Thank you for letting me tell it. that story, I dude. I ice cream out of it now. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, that's not true. That thing's long done. Oh my God, dude, you are the greatest. You are the greatest. Yeah. It's so great. Oh my God. Um, so Pete, after that, I don't know how we <laughs> topped that story, which is so good. Um, what we, we like to play two games here. Who owned you and who did you own is the first game. So who, who owned you? And if you don't tell us, we're going to look it up anyhow. So you got, I know, you know, a couple guys, you guys you own first, who'd you own? You guys looking it up could take a couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I really, yeah, you're gonna. I, I don't know the baseball. My kids do this all the time. I know oh, Barry dude. Bonds kind of wore me out. <clears throat> Not, I know well, Tony Gwynn wore me out. I walk you through some. Um, you, you battled yeah. with Sammy Sosa. You guys battled like you struck him out twenty times. He hit and he got runs. you five times. Yeah. Uh, Ron Gant, you you pretty yeah. much got. You yeah. had him. You had his number. Uh, Fifteen strikeouts. I did. Yeah. Fifteen strikeouts, one sixty nine batting average. Let's let's. Do you do remember it. Ron Gant? He had a zero percent body fat and was like a black belt in karate. <laughs> yeah, he was a monster. A nice guy. Too. He, I never wanted to make that guy. He was a nice guy too. I didn't yeah. talk to many hitters, but I'd see him in the tunnel and say, "Hey, Ron," he'd be like, "Hey, what's up?" Uh-huh. I never wanted to make that guy mad. They were like, oh, "He's like a black belt in karate." I'm like, "All right, I'll just stay away." From yeah. Him. Do you know who? <laughs> do you know who hit the most home runs off of you in their career? In your career. Uh, I'm going to say, is the number five, is it five or is it more than that? It's six. Oh my God. That's terrible. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to say, I want to say it's probably, it's not Hal Morris, but it could be. I'm going to say, I'll go with Barry Bonds. Is it Barry Bonds? No. Eric Karros. Really? 30, 38 plate appearances. You struck him out eight times. He only hit 222, but six of his seven... Six of his eight really? hits were homers, and one was a double. Uh, really? Yeah. Six home runs. Eric Carroll. <laughs> wow. Man, he, he must have liked the high fastball, because that's pretty much what I threw. <laughs> I threw everybody the same pitch. So yeah. it was just kind of a, I just flipped the coin. I'm throwing you a fastball. I'll occasionally bounce a breaking ball, see if you swing at that, and then I'm throwing a high fastball. <laughs> Bonds hit, the but, analytics would have loved me, right, Casey? <laughs> oh, hell like, yeah. The, the way they pitch now, that's how I pitched. Yeah, you'd be a – you'd be yeah. one, you would, the high would heater love and the breaking yeah. ball below, that's yeah. what I did. Yeah. 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 But otherwise, <laughs> nobody really owns you. And like I said, you faced some of the greatest players. Let's see. Fred McGriff, 256, only one homer. Uh, yeah. uh, Terry Pendleton. He had some big hits off me. I remember that tomahawk chop stuff. Yeah. I remember him hitting 16. a big double off me with like the bases loaded with the tomahawk chopping going on. It was <laughs> yeah. terrible. Larry Walker. Larry Walker was a uh, tough one for you. Yeah. Uh, Tony Gwynn was tough on everybody. Hit 364 against you. Let's find some crappy guys. Oh, uh, I saw before one guy who could not hit you at all was David Justice, and he was a stud at that time. 40. Oh yeah, David Justice. I actually had him pretty pretty. He was a low ball hitter, man. Yeah, five the, the hit- low ball hitters. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Five hits and 45 plate appearances. Keep going. You're the greatest. You're making me feel so <laughs> good about myself. <laughs> we gotta do Dude, you. Pete, your numbers are You're my new you best had, friend. <laughs> you had some unbelievable years, Pete. You, your numbers, you have some unbelievable years out there, man. You, For real, I mean. Let's go back I, to the I, beginning. I appreciate that. I didn't suck, and I wasn't a Hall of Famer. <laughs> I know, it's so true. There you go. Yeah. All Thank right. you. Beautiful. That's what I love about this show, bro. Some of my, you know, you, my dear friends that are on this show, I'm like, fuck, I didn't realize how good you guys were. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was really just good. the funny guy in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew, I knew better than that. I might go to spring training next year. You guys help me out. You think I could fit in the uniform? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you could. I think you could. Uh, Pete Horn is making his third start. He, ever since he started wearing the Spanx, he's been really good. I'd be so sick, right? Oh, I got the girdle on. I'm pitching with the girdle on. The Spanx. Oh. <laughs> All right, the last thing we do, Peter, Chinch asked oh. nine questions, nine questions, nine, we'll call it nine and 90. 
boom, I'll answer, then you answer second. Just these are kind of ridiculous questions. Yeah. But Hold fun. on, but this this has to be over now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I get to come back? Can I come back? <laughs> oh, we're gonna have Pete Harness tart yeah. part two, hundred percent. And I Can have to go. I have go to go make a anything? living because we're not paying. We're not getting paid for this. We gotta go. I gotta go <laughs> mow some lawns outside to yeah. keep this computer on. <laughs> I'll keep checking the mail for my round trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hall of Fame baseball broadcaster Marty Brenneman here. It's time for nine in ninety, the most ridiculous segment. In all of sports. All right, here, you ready for these, Sean? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Long Island, strong line. All right, first one, tough one. What's worse, an eyelash in your eye or like a hair strand on your tongue? Oh, hair strand on your tongue. No, I like, I actually like that. (laughs) I'll go with the the eyelash in my eye. Okay. I'd say I'd say the hair on your face when you're like ah oh, 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 like that I hate that. Nice. The, the 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 amount of hair you had to climb over after we sheared Casey <laughs> on a week, after a weekend doubleheader. <laughs> okay, simple one here. Movie theater. Do you like going to the movie theater? Or do you like sitting at home with your uh, oh big movie TV theater? Hundred percent. Hundred million. Hey, who's playing this game? Me or you? No, no I, I go first. You. Hey, I go first. Oh, you go second. You, you must. They play. must not have taught you directions in Fordham. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? I didn't How know to follow played. directions. I thought you guys were asking me. I thought you cared about me. No, we did. You both <laughs> answered. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got it now. I didn't know okay. how to play. No, it's good. It's the first time. <laughs> All right. Damn so, it. movie theater or home Damn theater? <laughs> Uh, I I haven't really actually gone to the movie theater in a while, you know, with all the stuff that's gone on. But I love. I'm definitely a movie theater guy. Nice. All right. Uh, I saw Top Gun in the movie theater recently. Just saying, uh, great movie. If you haven't seen haven't Top seen Gun, you gotta see it. It's so good. It's so good for real. It's so good. Ooh. Could you understand it, or did somebody have to explain it? To you? <laughs> I had an interpreter next to me explaining what was oh, okay. going on. All right. That's good. <laughs> Are you into the Amazon shopping or going to a store, Case? Amazon. Hmm? I don't do anything uh, on the internet besides the Zoom, and I didn't know I could even do this. <laughs> it was I fun. thought I was going to have trouble getting on Zoom, so I'm going to go to the store every day. <laughs> My wife has it down, though. I have to say, Donna has it down to where she shops, and she's like, something will be on TV. We'll see it. There'll be a commercial. She's like, oh, that would be interesting. That would be nice for your mom or whatever. And we'll be, you know, laying in bed watching the news late at night. And she turns over, picks up the phone, hits literally two buttons, and says it'll be at your mom's house tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> like, it's Definitely. You did. hit two buttons on the phone. How did you do that? I was like, don't worry. And sure enough, my mom has it like eight hours later. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Case, have you ever or would you ever wear leather pants? <laughs> oh, I never have, but... I don't know. Maybe I would at some point. Maybe you know. Maybe to turn back the clock when I'm sixty or something. Um, I I, I was gonna wear those, upstairs, <laughs> and I cut. Hey, I cut the butt out. So you guys want me to go put those on? <laughs> I I cut the butt out, and I have black ones upstairs. If you want me to put them on? I'll, I'll show them to you. That's a yes. <laughs> we want you to. We want you to. All right. <laughs> Next one. This is a good question here. Is it called a hoagie, a hero, or a grinder? Uh, a hoagie. No. This is a regional thing. <laughs> yes. Oh it's, my God. It's, a hero, it's a hero for me. I grew up on Long Island, and my brother-in-law, Tony asked me this, too. my brother-in-law owned a deli. I worked in a deli. Yeah. Started working in a deli when I was 12 to, like, when I got out of college. And I, I worked a lot and did a lot. I closed the store. It was, you know, it was awesome. It was an awesome deli. So you ba- you basically big league the deli when you when you made it to the big leagues. You're like, hey, see you later, guys. I can't make heroes anymore because I'm throwing pitches in the big leagues too big time uh, now. Well, it just became an issue of maybe slicing my finger off on the <laughs> <laughs> having no more day, career. Back in the day, that deli that deli by Hofstra was unbelievable. Do you remember that one? Am I just calling no, that I've one? Never, I was further, you know, Comac. We oh, had yeah, you know, Comac came on out. Jericho Turnpike. Oh, Jericho Turnpike. That's right. All yeah, right. yeah. All right, here we go. Case, would you have? Oh, better season, spring or fall? Oh, I'm, a, I'm a fall guy. I love fall. But up here in Pittsburgh, four seasons, I love it. Yeah. I'm a fall guy for sure. It's still warm football. out most most yeah. of the fall. Mm. You got fantasy footballs kicking off. We get our drafts done in the fall. 
um, which are always a circus. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll go with fall. The spring is too cold. Spring yeah. sounds nice, but it never really gets warm until June. You know. Good call. All right, hard shell tacos or soft shell tacos, Sean? I'm a hard shell taco guy. I love the hard shell with like you know a little bit of like <laughs> ground beef just piling out the sides, real nice some cheese, lettuce, sour cream. <laughs> Absolutely not! You disgust me, and I don't want you, I want you to stop talking about that. Right now. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a soft shell, and if you want to go hard to turn them into like uh, what do they call them? Those uh, enchiladas or whatever. Oh, when I yeah. put the sauce and milk, more cheese on top, they yeah. roll them up, and those things are insane. So I don't really, I don't really do tacos. Plus, I I, I like to watch my girlish figure, so I, I, I tend to eat them in lettuce wraps. Yeah, there you go. Okay, last one. Right now. That's not nine. Go ahead. No, this one's well, not, No, I know. Just, it's eight. I skipped one. Uh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who would win in a race right now, Sean Casey or Pete Harnish? Um, Case? How do you want to answer that? Uh, <laughs> well, I'd have to say that Pete still probably uh, rides his bike and works out really hard on cardio. And so I think I would still win, though. Well, I'll just say he would start. <laughs> How far, if we're talking, let's say it's 100 yards. Okay. He would probably have the lead at the 40-yard mark, but then he stops to get this beautiful haircut and his makeup <laughs> that he's so accustomed to now with all the bulls. All the bulls. I can't see this. Every time I turn on the TV, this guy's somewhere else. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I can't watch. I, I just I would win in the end because he would stop to do all that stuff. There you go. All right. That's all nice. Oh, man. That's it. Hey, Peter. Seriously, brother, it, it was so great seeing you a couple months ago. <clears throat> and thanks for having coming on with us this time, man. This has been so great, so fun. And uh, you're the best, man. Thanks a lot. Uh, no, I really appreciate you guys uh, having me on. And uh, I'm coming out to Pittsburgh. So we're going to play some in the fall. I'm coming out. We're going to play a little oh. golf. We're going to get some dinner. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I spend some time. We're going to spend a couple days. Dude, I would love that, bro. I would love that. You, me, boo, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do it upright. It'll be <laughs> awesome, man. Thanks for everything. Right, man. Tell Thanks. Don I said hi, and and, uh, and Nick and Jack. Tell Jack good luck at Santa Clara. Let's go. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Good luck to you okay. boys, too. Okay, nice man. you guys. Take care. Awesome. Okay, Peter. See you, man. Love you, brother. See you. See you, bud. Dude, I told you he's the greatest. The greatest. <laughs> oh, my God, oh, my dude. God. He's like a stand-up comedian. Amazing. Oh, my God, bro. Oh, my God. There were so many other ways to go. I just We couldn't get there. I know. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's just amazing. That every every guy we've had on has been like, have you had harness on yet? Have you had harness on yet? And now we have. <laughs> I know. Now we finally have. Yeah, he sounds so great, dude. He sounds like dude, a Long you, Islander, man. Do you know why? Because he's the greatest teammate ever, dude. Like, he's like the greatest person. Like, you can tell. If you're around Pete Harness, you're better because of it. You're, you're, you're guaranteed to laugh. But, you know, I've seen the serious side of Pete, too. He's, you yeah. know, he's just a good dude. He's, he, whatever you need from Pete as a friend, he's there. Like, I'm telling you, that's why so many guys on this show talk yeah. about, have you had Harnish on? How's Harnish? Yeah. He's the funniest guy, this and that, you know? So I loved hearing I'm so him glad talk. we had him on. Dude. I loved everything he said about coaching, everything he said that he told the pitchers. So good. Oh, oh, man. It's just so awesome that you finally had him on. He was like the missing the missing link the to missing that, link. that yeah. crew that every single person comes on the show. It's like, where's Harnish? <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen Harnish yet. I know. <laughs> it's oh, so great. I'm so glad we did that, man. That's so yeah. great. That's awesome. Nice. But, yeah, he's the best man, like you said. Dude, Go look at his numbers too, man. Like Big you know, time. when you break it down, this guy was legit. Yeah, he said you know, it, and, and he has a th dude. He has a career three eight nine ERA yes, in fourteen in years in the, the big steroid leagues. era. In the steroid in the, era. In the steroid era. I mean, you go back. He had a two seven one year, three seven two nine eight, mm -hmm. three six eight, four two one, mm -hmm. three one four in ninety eight with the with the Reds, three one four. Then a three six eight on that ninety eight team. I mean, dude, yeah. uh, just, just and one of the hardest man. workers you ever seen too. Yeah, and you know I, the the way he seems to carry himself on a field. Like he's first of all, where I grew up, Pete Harnish's name, you know it, everybody knows it. And then when he comes, came back home, you know, kind of played for the Mets. We didn't even get too far into that, but like it, just the way he carried himself on a field, he's easily could have been one of the favorite players on any team he played on. Like yeah. I, I guarantee oh, he, every he, fan he, he was him. because you could yeah, tell he, he was, left dude. it out there every single. He even said it just now. Every pitch. He did. He, Dude, he left it you out. were scared of Pete on game days. You're like, don't talk to Harnish. Like, <laughs> yeah. It was scary. It's like it's like a pit bull eating his freaking yeah. ribeye. You're oh like, my Jesus. god! I really want to. I wonder what would happen if him and Mickey Tellington fought. He oh, said he said awesome. Tellington was bigger than him, but 
I looked up there at that time. They were pretty much the exact same size. Maybe oh, Tettleton would have definitely an thrown down. Yeah, yeah. it would have been awesome. And Tettleton <laughs> was kind of a badass dude. That would have been intense. <laughs> so great, dude. Yeah. Oh my god, so great. Well, yeah, man. we did it again, Chinch. We finally we had a harness on. I know. And uh, you know, we can, it's our we, can we can rest easy. Our we golden can rest goose. Easy. It's our unicorn. Yeah, yeah we, <laughs> we finally got him. <laughs> oh my, dude. I, I, and I, I'm, dude. I'm, I, I know that story. That story is one of the funniest stories ever. It was just, it was such a joke in our clubhouse. Yeah. And then. Next thing you know, Pete made it a reality, and it was so freaking funny. <laughs> so it was ridiculous. Crazy. That's the stuff you do if you if you play 162 games, you, you start going stir crazy. Yeah. You know, you need guys and that have fun, and you do stuff that's a little off the wall because you got to absolutely to make it through the year. I can only imagine, dude. I can only imagine. <laughs> awesome, so dude. funny. All right, another so, great all right, one, man. man. Another great show, Chinchy. Love you, brother, and to everybody out there. Thanks for listening. We are so appreciative, and we see the numbers climbing. Help them keep climbing. Pass the word on. Share us with somebody. Subscribe, download all the good stuff. But yep. Chichi, I love you, man. I'll see love you. you uh, I'll see you next week. Yes, sir. Okay, buddy. <laughs>